Not this rule. <laughs> no, right. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the November 4th Governance and Priorities Committee meeting. I'd like to first recognize that we are on the traditional territory of this Naval First Nations. Our clerk this afternoon will be Ms. Sheila Gurry. Uh, there is a question period sign up sheet. It's on the desk over the side the side. Right there. <laughs> Uh, if during the meeting any member of the gallery has a question regarding an agenda item, please write down your name and the agenda item on the sheet. At the start of the question period, the chair will call these, those who have signed up to, to the podium to address council. Ms. Gurry, any uh, introduction of late items? Um, thank you, Chair. So just the one late item, it's just the addition of the presentation for the mobility um, downtown mobility hub project. We uh, had missed it from the original agenda. Thank you. <clears throat> we have a motion to adopt the agenda as amended. So, being seconded by the Council of Corps, seconded by the Council of Thank you. All those in favor? Carried. Uh, we require a motion now to adopt the minutes as circulated. The agenda. Mm -hmm. We just did the agenda. Yeah. Moved by Councillor Bonner, seconded by Councillor Hemmins. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Carried. So, um, I believe Mr. Harding, you're going to be introducing the program here. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Council, for the time. This is a, a first phase of a project we've been wanting to bring back to you since the end of summer when the yeah, you got back in session and then finished first phase of both the a program and the, um, working out the findings of the program. So hopefully you all have a copy in front of you which will look a little bit. This is actually the finding of the pro project. Again, it's, it's a, I'll, I'll talk to the purpose of what we did, something, something we were trying to work on for a variety of years with DIU, uh, school board, and park recreation, and city of Nanaimo. Uh, and this one particularly is, is working with you on how to ensure, and, uh, Joanne Schroeder, which I'll turn over to in a moment, will explain a lot better than I have of just how do we find more and more ways of engaging youth at a younger age into healthy lifestyles, which of course is getting from um, eating nutrition to activity. So the purpose of, the, of this project, project, which is our phase one project, we'll talk a little bit more at the very end of future phases, the Rec Recreation Prescription Project is a collective partnership between the City of Nanaimo Parks Recreation, the City of Nanaimo, uh, Vancouver Island U University, School District 68, and primary care providers to promote youth health and well-being. Um, the goals of this project, and again, Joanna will, will show some of the results of it, is goals to build positive collaborative networks that support health and well-being for youth, Build the capacity of youth in the preteen period through purposeful engagement in recreation programs and to create sustainable relationships that evaluate practices contributing to intersectoral, collaborative, and um, accountability based public policy. So, it's all the different agencies, how do we find ways to work together to, to ensure this? I mean, I'm going to do the vision. I wasn't going to do the vision, but the vision was our vision um, has everyone engaged in meaningful, accessible recreation and experience that foster individual well being, well being of na nature and built environments, and community well being. So that's the background. Again, as Joanne goes through, if should ever, all council should have a copy of the findings. But now I'll turn over to Joanne, who's also got some VIU students from each area of VIU that, that worked on the project. And they're going to say a few words also. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, what you see in front of you here is what is called photo voice methodology. It means that students were given a, uh, a camera and were able to take evidence and tell a story through photo voice. So, uh, can you pause that for one sec? Um, started? Yeah. One sec. I just want to tell you that all the pictures that have been taken are that you will see here are, are taken by students in this project. And this is a Pecha Kucha type of presentation. It means that there are no words on the slide. I'm going to speak to each slide and hopefully do it within 20 seconds. All right, thank you. 
So recreation is a preventative health field. Here we have a youth that said, this is me and my baby shark playing basketball in the great outdoors. <laughs> this project is solutions based. It is uh, 300, took a 360, lens, 360 perspective lens to address systemic issues of youth health and well-being within our community. Some of the questions we explored in this project, it was a project as well as research, is to what extent can an intersectoral intervention of recreation prescription influence health and well-being in grade five students? And also we were looking at the improvements and intersectoral and interdisciplinary collaborations. Three schools were involved, which included 120 children. Those children came, come from some of our most vulnerable schools in Nanaimo that are headed on what we would say an ill health trajectory. And so 101 of them were consenting research participants, which is amazing for this population that their adult or their parent ensured they could be involved in the research. And 88 respondents is what is the respondents to your report. How did we walk this out? There were 16 weeks of recreation programming and there were three data points pre, mid, and post health assessment, including nursing, public health, and our primary care providers in the community. We had a pre, post wellness survey, and then we had the photographic evidence by the youth themselves. Kids ultimately desire to be healthy. They are innately playful, and they are at a complex developmental stage when they are 10 years old. They are in full development, and we know that an ecological systems approach identifies that they are embedded in their community as an individual, with their family, with their peers, and within their school. The goals of the project were embedded in the Canadian National Recreation Framework, and we were addressing three key things, social connectedness, physical activity, and mental health, which we call mental fitness. The priorities for the entire project looked at um, areas of active transportation, connection to nature, inclusion and access, collaborative systems, access to food, nutrition, digital detoxing our kids from screen time, and we were looking at that through capacity development through our emerging professionals. Who are those emerging professionals? We had 25 BIU students that came from interdisciplinary, and we saw them as role models. Child and youth care, which were our behavioral and emotional specialists. Nursing, physical education, recreation. We strive for a one to four relationship with our students. And we spent a lot of time training because these disciplines talk different language even though they're after the same end game. Thumbs up for collaboration. This was made possible through Island Health Wellness Grant. It, was, it included School District 68, as Richard mentioned, City of Nanaimo Parks and Recreation, VIU, and primary health care providers coming from Island Health. So what did we actually do in this project? <clears throat> Recreation isn't just fun and games, but when purposefully planned, it has power. It has power within our community. It was two hours of um, programming within the school time connected to the Ministry of Education grade five curriculum. And it included active play via open spaces, trails, parks, and facilities here in Nanaimo. These we call our junior joiners. When you're 10, you still are interested in joining. Hit 11, 12, 13, not so much, because that peer pressure really kicks in. So they're willing to try. They're at that developmental growth, physical, mental, and they are full explosion of their growth. And we know we need a three-year longitudinal period to study, um, to study and to show evidence. Our kids uh, took photos of their own story of what does a healthy lifestyle look like or not. And 82% of girls eat one or more sugary candies or drinks per day, and 65% of boys. 35% of our boys in Nanaimo live in tobacco environments and 40% of girls. Parks and recreation organizations, primarily public agencies, play a role in facilitating and managing opportunities to be recreationally active. But kids are looking for safe spaces, they're looking for access. So the grade five active pass through parks and recreation was embedded within this project, getting as many kids into these places and spaces. The program included fit bit challenges. That means little bits of challenge at a time to make changes.
things like no sugary drink for the weekends, and yet 54% of boys are overweight or obese, and 50% of 55%. Now we have to be careful to interpret that because this is their developmental age. What hit the team smack in the face is access and inclusion. So kids cannot participate when they do not have proper gear, footwear, clothing, jackets. It's hard to kick a ball when you're wearing rubber boots that are three sizes too big. So we moved into another project called Shed Your Threads, which is collecting um, gear within the community. <clears throat> We are moving in the right direction. This was a proof of concept. Interdisciplinary was a powerful career altering experience for our students. Intersectoral support in being co-applicants in supporting new funding applications. And we keep moving forward. That ball is getting closer to its, its goal. $20,000 has been secured through Vancouver Foundation to move into our second phase where we are right now, which is in a convened phase, to really probe the systemic issues and root causes in health and well-being in our community. But this is messy, messy work. It's complex and we have to get right to the grassroots of what is going on. Systemic change is complex and recreation as intervention for health inequities reflects the emerging shift towards a collaborative approach. But we talk different languages within our disciplines, but we're after the same end game. Nursing, or the field of health, talks uh, determinants of health and population health. Recreation talks leisure continuity, reducing barriers and increasing access. Child and youth care talk protective factors and um, emotional uh, issues for children, and yet we need each other and we are stronger together in this community. Thank you for listening to the Recreation Prescription Project. In 20 seconds. <laughs> At this time I would like to invite, um, or actually we're going to do the other video, who we don't have in our room and able to join us is our nursing students. They wanted to have a voice, but they're actually writing an exam and I couldn't get them to skip that. So they are going to um, talk to us here on the screen for a moment. And this is Bobby Dean, who is representing our nursing students. And there was, there's been a team of them all the way through the project. And they're just, she is speaking on behalf of that group. So Shed Your Threads came out of the idea that these kids just didn't have gear. So we've applied for another grant on the circular economy, which is sharing, swapping, trading of recreational gear. And I bet I'm all of you. Share. There we go. Go ahead. Okay. All of you have gear in your closet. So the intention is to mobilize gear within our community to move them into children's um, those that you know don't have access as well to be able to move them into their homes and into their families so that they are able to actually access and then in spring we'll be putting on an event called shed your threads which will include all of the partners that we've mentioned everyone my name is Bobby Deans and I will be speaking on behalf of the fourth year nursing students at BIU who have been involved with the recreation prescription project for the last two semesters Thank you for having us here today. We wish we were be able to be there in person, but we still wanted to be able to share our incredible experiences that we had. We have had the opportunity to work alongside leaders who are striving to create actual systemic changes to promote the health of individuals, families, and the community of Nanaimo. Working within an interdisciplinary, intersectoral team that's within the Recreation Prescription Project, has shown us the force a multi-pronged approach can have in fighting complex societal issues that are present today, such as childhood obesity, improper nutrition, increased of screen-based media, and exposure to tobacco and vaping, which are so prevalent in today's time. So from the nursing component of the team, we conducted a needs assessment and partnered with students to help them build capacity to make informed choices regarding their health and wellness, regardless of their societal circumstances. As well, using um, an upstream approach, we witness their ability to promote health using a primary prevention model. So primary prevention is done mainly through education and increases the health literacy within students to help avoid disease or illness before it actually occurs. 
Therefore, increasing these capacities within the pre-adolescence equips them with the tools needed to live happy and healthy lives, which could potentially cause a ripple effect within the families and communities they live and work in. So, using this approach also has the potential to decrease the growing cost and burden to our healthcare systems that we experience so often today, especially in our profession. So the Recreation Prescription Project initiative have the potential to facilitate much needed changes in the health and wellness of our children and society today. We hope that this research project will continue to grow towards a permanent fixture within the community as we recognize the value to that the project has. We are also so grateful for our experiences and learning that we have had working with the project. So thank you again for listening and uh, keep up the great teamwork everyone. <laughs> That was the voice from our nursing students. I'd like to ask Alicia Coombs to come forward. And Alicia was the coordinator of the project. She's a graduate of a tourism degree and recreation at VIU. Thank you, Alicia, for joining us. And she's going to bring her perspective from the recreation lens. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me here today. My name is Alicia Coombs, and I am a graduate of Vancouver Island University with a degree in recreation, um, sorry, a degree in tourism, majoring in recreation and sport management. In my last semester of university, my cohort was given the opportunity to write a grant for Joanne Schroeder's Rec Governance class. I thought to myself, great grant writing, this shall be fun. <laughs> <laughs> Little did I know that this grant would not only change my life, but the lives of 120 grade four, five, and six students, 25 VIU students in the health advocate team, and bring four VIU disciplines, nursing, sport health and physical education, child and youth care, and recreation together to, to start an important conversation about health and well-being within Nanaimo's youth. My role with the project started out as a student writing a grant paper and ended as a VIU graduate as the Recreation Prescription Project Coordinator. The project was not only a job for me, but a passion. Each and every day, I learn something new from the students and health advocate team. The interdisciplinary and intersectoral approach allowed for students to learn from a variety of fields, all giving the same message, promoting youth, health, and well-being. 16 weeks of purposeful recreation and leisure activities brought a variety of experience to the students. Walking to local parks, swimming, skating, hiking, sleep exercises, Learning about mental fitness and creating easy and healthy cookbooks are just a few things the students were involved in. Throughout the weeks, it was amazing to watch relationships build between the students and health advocates as the students were motivated to try and learn new things. Some of my favorite memories from the project include watching students learn about the City of Nanaimo Active Pass, seeing students sample fruits or vegetables they have never had before, the nurses facilitating health conversations about sleep, stress, hydration, heart rate, and having those discussions go home called health fits. Mm -hmm. Running into a parent of a student in the community and discussing how the project has changed her and her daughter's relationship and how they both are working towards a healthier and more active lifestyle. Being able to work with such a great interdisciplinary team and lastly, and most importantly, building lasting relationships with students and their teachers. A joint effort of the Interprovincial Sport and Recreation Council and Canadian Parks and Recreation Association established the Pathways to Wellbeing. This initiative outlined, outlined five priorities for recreation in Canada, which the Recreation Prescription Project embodies. Active living, supportive environments, inclusion and access, connecting to people and nature, and recreation capacity. The framework states that recreation has the potential to address challenges and troubling issues. This, inc this includes increases in sedentary living and obesity, decreased contact with nature, and inequities that limit recreation opportunities. This project, the Recreation Prescription, was a collaborative effort between the City of Nanaimo BIU, Island Health, and SD68. I believe that the Recreation Prescription Project has the opportunity to address these challenges and issues here in Nanaimo, create strong emerging leaders for Vancouver Island University students, and strengthen developing relationships between our um, cohort. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. And lastly, 
lastly, I'd like to invite Georgia Brennan to come up. Georgia was a health advocate, and so that means that the students in an interdisciplinary team worked with the students, and Georgia represented that group of students. She is a VIU student in Recreation and Tourism degree. Hello, uh, my name is Georgia Brennan. I'm in my third year in Tourism Management, majoring in Sports and Rec. Um, I promise I didn't just write this speech 20 minutes ago. <laughs> Um, my role in recreation prescription, prescription project was a health advocate. Um, I assisted Alicia along with other VIU students in the programming and facilitation um, components of the project. It was an honor to be a part of this collaborative partnership um, and to be able to work um, with the other disciplines um, in the university. I enjoyed learning about how each of the disciplines um, approached wicked problems such as childhood well-being. Um, it was really interesting to see the collaboration of all of the different students come together to work for um, a similar goal. Speaking from a sports and recreation lens, the intersectoral approach that was adopted for this project was most influential um, to my education and career path. As a third year student, I am eager to see how recreation prescription project will influence further community initiatives um, in the future. Specifically in Nanaimo, I hope that um, intersectoral approaches continue to address um, wicked problems. Um, as a third year student, I will soon be entering the workforce um, and I will continue to pursue intersectoral approaches. Yes, thank you. Chair and Council, again, we just want to thank you for the time to present. We wanted to bring this to you. This is one project that's going out there in the community. Uh, we have a number of aspects. Uh, we have a couple final words. If there's any questions. So thank you. My final words are just to tell you where we're at in the project, just confirming again that our recreation prescription last year was a proof of concept. Literature shows us that recreation uh, can be used as an intervention, but we wanted to prove it here in Nanaimo, working with our stakeholders and our partners. That we've proved. Now we move forward into the convene stage, which is what did we, what did we not know? Who did we not include? Um, what did we learn? And then to move forward in further granting. So the opportunity to con continue to work with our partners is strong, and uh, people are motivated to be there. Thank you. Yes, we have at least two questions, uh, starting with Councillor Armstrong, followed by Councillor Ford. Thank you very much. Appreciate all that you've done. Uh, I was heavily involved with Kids for Kids again, which is partnerships with VIU. And the problem that we saw with that is that once your key people go, both the programs die. What is there to keep this program running and what do you require? Yeah, a great question. And exactly that point is that ambassadors come and they go. And so leadership and capacity building is key within the project, meaning these students from VIU rotate through and have already, we've had a group of nursing students, for example, move out, and they encourage the next group of students to come in. So it's leadership capacity building. And what do we need going forward? We need that continued collaboration within our team and we continue to apply for funding to be able to move that project. I, my intention is it's not a one-time project that gets attached and then off we go, which is what we're so familiar with. It's embedded within our school system. SD68 is um, a strong partner here and it aligns so strongly with our BC curriculum in grade five so that we can extend beyond three schools. That was a proof of concept. We wanna see it in every school at that age group and once we develop at that age group, there's no reason it can't be developed into an adult population. So then from a city perspective, you'd be looking for an advocacy role. Like to advocate for it, or? Yeah, and Chair, if I can answer that. I guess a couple examples I was um, taking this council on strong list are some of the Survive program for, for grade three. Again, our, with our collaboration agreement with council and the school board, we were able to try a pilot project for getting every grade three student through uh, Summa Survive. We had a grant for that. Uh, over the years, though, it's become so embedded that it's, it happens every year. Um, and that's an example of what we do. The same with Health Among Us, again, with school district. This is more some of the more formal agreements we're trying to do with VIU. So as we make more of these agreements, these try agreements with the different groups, we continue to build and continue to build. So that's an example, and I think those are the examples we build on. Same with the Grade 5 Active Pass, which was a little bit of a foundation. Council supported the Grade 5 Active Pass. We continue to do that. Just another way of using 
that, who's working on it. Kind of Let's add a last comment is that research was embedded in this right from the beginning, right from the grant application right through where we are now. And that's what's important also is the evidence creation. So not just a project that is intervention, but creating the data that allows us to okay, where are we at and then how do we move forward from that within our research program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, through you, uh, a couple of uh, comments and questions, if I may. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, education and uh, sports and recreation have been main interests of my career for many years, and I really appreciate uh, the work that you're telling us about. I see it as being extremely valuable, uh, proactive. Uh, you talked about preventable uh, actions, and you're hitting the kids at just the right age. Um, so good on you, and I, and I certainly wish you success in the future. A couple of questions um, uh, regarding physical activity. I noticed three elementary schools were involved in your study, and the reporting out on physical activity indicated uh, 35, 36 percent for males and females uh, for daily uh, activity. Did that include uh, physical activity as part of the school curriculum, or was it simply outside of school hours? Yeah, good question. For clarification, they had actually, the question that was posed to them was after school. So it's not inclusive of their time with us. Good, I'm pleased to hear that. And I know many schools, at least when I was in the system, were advocating for daily phys ed and uh, increasing uh, participation in physical activities because Aside from what you indicated in your report, health benefits of regular and physical activity include improved fitness, strength, and feeling better. There's also certainly documentation that physical activity leads to better academic results in school, so it's just so important. Uh, one other question, if I may, Chair. Uh, you reference uh, tobacco and effects, and, and obviously doing some education on the harmful effects of a tobacco environment. Have you, or would you consider extending that to dealing with other drugs? Uh, so the, the scope of this research project just looked at tobacco and smoking, but we know that there is evidence that connects behavioral use of tobacco into other areas as well. So that's where the research needs to go. When we look at longitudinal, we have to extend some of this, and vaping is a huge part right now. And uh, the importance, too, also of male and female. It becomes questionable of why do we need to identify tobacco in male and female, but from a health projection, we definitely see the impact of a female impacted differently uh, as, she, as she developed as a male does. And so we definitely want to look at the aspects of other um, types of tobacco that they consume and their health trajectory based on that. Thank you. The reason for my question is that we recently discovered that unfortunately in the school system the drug awareness programs that used to be offered are largely not now because of staffing problems so that might be something you could extend your your uh, research to look at and your education uh, efforts. Thank you very much. Councilor Gessler. Thank you Chair. Through you. Uh, first, yeah, thank you so much for the presentation. I, I love hearing the words uh, intersectoral, interdisciplinary and all the collaboration with the school district <laughs> and uh, BIU, it's, it's really important that we all work together and, and focused on our youth. Um, question I have just uh, with the statistics. Um, in comparison to, to other jurisdictions in BC, what was the sense of where uh, Nanaimo youth were, were comparing and, and, and if that was sort of part of the... So, so the report that you have for you really creates, creates a baseline of where we, what we found out and where we started. Our next phase is actually the comparison. How does this compare to our regional area? And Island Health has a lot of that data. And how does that compare provincially and nationally right across the board? So I don't have the answer for that yet. We know that um, Island Health data would show us that this particular region is lower in a number of areas, but I don't have 100% yet because we're right in that stage of data analysis beyond our baseline. So we're working at it. Great, thanks so much for work. You're welcome. Any further questions? Hearing none, I just, go ahead, Mr. Oh, okay. Hearing none, I'd just like to thank everyone that was involved in this project because it 
Um, I've been involved in minor sports for years, and, and uh, I have to agree that ten-year-olds are a lot easier to deal with. Than <laughs> but, uh, uh, anyway, thank you very much, and, and uh, certainly you're more than welcome to come back and make further presentations at any time. Yes, sir. Uh, Chair, that's as you mentioned, so we're going to continue work on here and work on this project. Board and then we have updates. We'll come back. We're also going to do the same presentation for the school board as well for the next little while. Uh, we'll make it harder. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to make a little bit of noise now to take the stuff down. Sorry. We'll take the So this sets our foundation, but we do have a process, as always, to add committees and or take them away if necessary. So we can cancel committee meetings or add them when and if necessary. So I believe part of the agenda we require a motion. So move. So move. Second. Second. Secondary. Councilor Thorpe. Any questions? Seeing none, all in favor? Carried. Okay, now we get to Mr. Sims. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, just, I'm not going to stand up here very long. I'm going to quickly turn it over to Mr. Rose, who belongs to this project. Uh, this project, as Council is aware, has been going on for the better part of this year and is looking holistically at the downtown, a radius of about 800 meters of the, of the, the core of the downtown, and looking at a number of issues. We've been in front of you with a few of them. Uh, some of the quick wins that we brought forward were fell a little bit out of this, so it's a little bit of, out of our normal pattern of behavior. But this this is kind of looking at the bigger picture, and the consultant team has done an excellent job putting us together. We've got we've really um, got a high level of engagement with the community on this one, and uh, we'll talk. They'll walk walk you through and, and present some of the some of the findings of that engagement as well as some of the, the next steps. But this really kicks off the next phase of engagement for community input. So Mr. Rose will carry it from here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, pretty much uh, just ticked off every single thing that I was going to do. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, this is going to be short and sweet. Uh, as Bill said, we've got the uh, majority of the team here have been working on this over the last Because we do have a lot of information, it would probably be great if we could uh, hold questions or suggest that we hold questions so that we can come back and revisit the process as we need So, with that, I'm going to introduce uh, Mr. Bernard. Thank you. Thank you. So, good afternoon, all. Excited to be working with you folks on this project. Um, from all the guys out here around it, it's, uh, it's got some community interest, which makes it exciting. And there are certain staff members that have also been messaging me saying they're really keen to see something happen. And interestingly enough, we also heard that a lot of engagement sessions that, uh, you know, time to stop talking, folks, let's get something on the ground. So, and that's honestly in most of the projects we work um, on the planning level, we often go to our first engagement sessions. And the first thing we're is, 
Are you going to ask me the same questions again, or are you just going to build something? So, we're excited to be part of this, this team. So, how do I move the slides on? Just to the, there's a clicker on the, it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, we'll have to follow my notes. So we're going to we're going to do here's the outline of the presentation we'll do today. We first it's, we thought it's important to revisit the what the guidance we got from the transportation master plan because I really think there's some, some very key statements in that and also endorsed by the city and, and the community at the same time. Uh, we'll review some of those study objectives as well. Uh, just a bit of a refresh for those of you who don't remember. Obviously, we've, uh, we've been involved in this intimately, but I know you folks see it on, a, on an intermittent basis. Um, Jana here will give us feedback on the community engagement we've done so far. The quick win projects, we'll run through each of those. And then we have various other intersection and cycling improvements that are also part of the scope of this work. So we'll run through those. We'll then talk about the transit exchange and confirming the location of that exchange before moving into the uh, just a high level concept ideas for the parking strategy. Just for the ease of logistics, um, I think I'll do most of my piece, hand it over to Jana when she will do the engagement, then when we come back, I'll cover most of the elements before I hand the cycling stuff over to Richard, just so we're not um, jumping up and down and changing, changing speakers. So we might uh, change the order of the slides slightly, so just forgive us for that, but I think it's just logistically going to be work better. So who is the team? Um, uh, Mac Laney, myself, project manager, uh, Matt, sitting at the back there, Matt McDonald, he's, he's part of the team, and uh, Richard Jadol sitting next to him. Richard is an active transportation and cycling expert, and he's been giving us a lot of guidance on, on the work that we see here today. And then, of course, Jana with Lanark, and uh, they've been looking at the engagement of the public with which they would be. So that's really been the team. We've got another um, young lady in our team, um, Perna Krishan, who's been doing a lot of the traffic analysis and such work. So very compact team and uh, it's been very effective and thanks to the very quick response and turnaround we've had with the city's team too. So here's, this is taken from the from the transportation master plan and I thought to just read it um, because it really does set an important context for everything that we've been doing. So the transportation system can support these land use patterns with appropriate investments to enable and encourage people to walk, cycle and use transit. As part of the Nanaimo Transportation Master Plan, the public and stakeholders provided input and guidance on the priorities for developing the plan, as well as future investments in the city's transportation system. The hierarchy of modes shown below, i.e. left here, just read all of it, uh, shown, shown to the left, proposes that the city consider the needs of pedestrians, then cyclists, then public transit, then goods and service movements before that of, of private automobiles. By considering needs of these priority modes, future transportation plans, programs, and projects will provide better, safer, and more convenient solutions and encourage over time more people to walk, cycle, and ride the bus. And interesting, we've just heard a presentation on you know, making the younger generation far more healthy. And these all obviously are initiatives that, that work towards that. So you can see the, the order of priority that is, that is proposed in the master transportation plan. Again, pedestrians first, then cycling then transit, then commercial vehicles, and then cars. It's not to say you just ignore any of them, it's just if we're looking at future modes and things and future planning, if we want to get to mode shifts and with climate change initiatives and things like that, um, and encourage people to get out of their cars, we need to provide safe, safe facilities for those. So what were our objectives of the study is to develop uh, project solutions that can be built in the short term uh, within the five within the zero to five years time we were given some focal areas one being front street wallace street loop the albert street uh, corridor pearson bridge got added to the discussion as well and then various network connections around those from a traffic safety perspective there are various key intersections we'll run through each of those and transit there was to confirm the exchange location I think over the years you've seen a lot of background on the, on the transit exchange location. Obviously, we have the convenient opportunity right now to observe the exchange where it currently is and at least get user feedback from that. And I'll talk more about that later. Uh, parking, as I mentioned, we'll talk a little bit about the strategy and then also get community feedback, which you'll hear more here now. And then again, as I said, projects in the ground versus always talking about them. 
So with that, I'll actually hand the engagement piece over to Jana, and then we'll come back afterwards. Thanks, Bernard, and thanks everyone for um, having us. So I'm going to provide a brief overview of what we've heard so far from the public about the Downtown Mobility Hub project, and then provide an overview of some of the um, next steps that we're looking at. So I think a key takeaway as we've been going through this project is really people are ready for change in the downtown. And they're looking for projects that are going to enhance the livability um, and really work towards this vision of it as a thriving downtown core. And so a lot of people are excited about the momentum that they've seen. And as Bernard says, excited to see projects that are going to go into the ground. That said, we are now also at a stage um, where we're really looking forward to bringing up concepts and we're looking at turning ideas and policy into reality. Um, so literally, this is like the rubber hits the road stage, that's where we're at. Um, and so we're tabling ideas for physical changes, but people are actually, it's going to make a change to people's daily lives. So in the earlier slide, um, we did see the hierarchy of modes from the transportation master plan. And at the planning level, it can be very easy to generally support all of these types of initiatives. This policy, it makes a lot of sense. Now we're going to be discussing ways that we're going to change how people walk or cycle or drive or park in the downtown. And so this is a really important topic, and we should anticipate that when we're seeing that we're going to get a lot of various opinions on it. So the public engagement becomes a very important part of this concept stage. <coughs> so the Nanaimo Downtown Mobility Hub project is focused on confirming concepts that could be built in the next five years. So we want to know what to build first, generally what it's going to look like, and then we want to understand the challenges and issues that need to be dealt with when we get into step two, the detailed design. So the engagement component, uh, we started that in the spring of 2019, and we had some early technical engagements with the steering committee that included city departments, the RDN, and MOTI. And then we followed that up with a community engagement that really launched this initial phase where we focused on confirming issues, what's concerning people in the downtown, understanding where there's gaps, things people want to see addressed, and learning ideas so that these could be really factored into the identification of these short-term projects. So this fall, we've had a chance to meet again with the steering committee, and now we're preparing for the second round of public engagement, and we're going to bring forward these initial concepts for review and feedback. So we really see this engagement as an opportunity to table ideas, discuss some alternatives, and really understand the community's questions and concerns so that those are going to be addressed as the projects continue. So during the phase one engagement, we had a series of pop-up events, a really great stakeholder workshop that brought a lot of downtown voices together, an online survey, and as well as the various submissions from people in writing and in person. Participant numbers were moderate, but we had some really high quality inputs and discussions that went a long way into understanding what people were hoping to see. So I'm just going to touch briefly on the five topics that we discussed during the initial engagement. We started with the pedestrian ne network, and really the key themes we heard included here we're increasing pedestrian safety by reducing traffic speed, widening sidewalks, and dealing with some of the key missing links, wayfinding to help people get around the downtown, and there were a lot of comments about pedestrians becoming a higher priority, like we saw in that diagram. So many feel that downtown still feels very car-centric, and there's this interest for more crosswalks, pedestrian-oriented streetscapes, as well as even discussions came up around road closures so that we can start to shift that dynamic to a much more pedestrian-friendly area. In terms of locations where people really saw the biggest issues, people talked a lot about Front Street um, and that's being perceived as a four-lane barrier basically between the downtown core and the waterfront. There was a lot of input about Terminal Avenue and Nickel Street, which doesn't have too many people places for people to cross and concerns about that. And interestingly enough, people talked a lot about Commercial and Victoria Street not only as great places already, but places that could be even better looking at more closures for things like the night market or even potentially um, pedestrian-only segments sometime in the future. When it came to the cycling network, there was a really enthusiastic response from the cycling community. A lot of people recognized that there are facilities to get to the downtown, but once you get here, cycling is a lot more complicated. We did also hear responses from people who articulated concerns that bike facilities will change access for other modes. So we saw pretty much every end of that spectrum. The ideas that people really felt would make it easier to cycle downtown focused on end-of-trip facilities as well as protected bike lanes. So there was a lot of comments about people feeling like they're not good enough to cycle around downtown. They're scared. They don't feel like they're comfortable in the setting that's there. 
And then as Bernard mentioned, there were four potential short-term cycling routes that were popped forward during phase one. Front Street, Wallace, Albert, and the Gordon Street Museum Way connector. And all of these were indicated to have general support with Front Street seeing the highest support as having the greatest potential for change. When it came to transit, um, participants really emphasized that regardless of where the, transfer, the transit exchange ends up, it really needs to be well linked for pedestrian cyclists. People need to be able to get to it. And they also want it to be a high quality and a very attractive space, a place that feels safe and is very accessible, a place that's pedestrian oriented, and a place that feels like a hub, not a parking lot. So generally, we did hear support for the Front Street location. Um, and the major concerns that we heard related to that specific location was safety, so the general feeling of safety in the area, and then connectivity to other parts of the downtown, like the old city quarter, but now are a little bit further afield, and making sure that connectivity remains. When it came to key intersections, participants generally agreed that um, the early intersections that we were looking at would really benefit from all kinds of improvements, including pedestrian improvements. Unsurprisingly, the Albert Wallace commercial intersection came consistently forward as probably the biggest problem in all of the downtown. Uh, participants also felt that the intersection at Victoria, Nickel, and Esplanade, which is quite close to that one, is also a key one, but it's a lot of, uh, it's a very complicated intersection. Participants felt that the Bastion Wallace Fraser uh, five leg intersection um, wasn't bad, but it could definitely be to work better for pedestrians, reducing delays, making it a little bit more of a friendly place to be. <coughs> and participants recognize that front and church intersection as a potential priority. Um, so looking at, it's a very heavily um, vehicle oriented intersection right now, but in, with Dallas Square right there, there would be an opportunity to potentially regain some public space if some changes were made. And then most people um, felt that the bas Bastion and commercial intersection is working relatively well right now, but understood that there is a need or an opportunity to reinvestigate it, um, given that there's a need to replace or upgrade the existing traffic signals there. So there were a few other intersections that came up frequently. Um, the Fitzwilliam, the crosswalk salon Fitzwilliam came up quite, quite a lot. People aren't sure if cars are gonna stop for them at times. Uh, and we've already seen some changes there, so I think that's a really good positive. The intersections on Terminal, including Comox, uh, Fraser and Wentworth, came up a lot. Those are really tough locations and continue to be challenges for the community. And the one that um, I hadn't heard a lot about before but I thought was interesting was the Esplanade and Front Street intersection. And so this one was noted as being, this is a really car-oriented intersection and it's not been a problem in the past, but with the transit exchange heading in that location, that might be something to start thinking about in the future. And finally, input on parking really did cover one end of the spectrum to the other. So there's a lot, I think everyone knows, there's always diverse opinions on parking. The largest portion of input appears to say that there generally is enough parking and the costs are generally acceptable, but we definitely heard from one end to the other. A reoccurring theme was that people found that wayfinding to parking is really poor. So the parking's there, they just don't know how to get there. We also heard a lot about safety concerns, particularly related to parking garages and sometimes feeling unsafe in those locations. And the places that people felt parking was the most challenging were on Commercial Street, and the Courthouse area, Victoria Street, the Old City Quarter, as well as we heard several comments from about overnight parking from people living on the islands. So as you can see, we had a very, very broad range of ideas. Um, and there's a lot out there that is being talked about. There's a lot in the planning. And so we heard everything from, you know, we need to turn Commercial Street into a pedestrian only um, street, which is a big picture, long term plan. And then we heard things like we need to fix this curb let down on this corner because it's not working for accessibility. So very big, all the way down to very small. And all of this input is captured and recorded um, into the reporting, but it doesn't all fit the short term focus of the Downtown Mobility Hub project. So we needed to do some sorting. So many of the big ideas that are important to continue to move forward, but also have complexities that make it more difficult to really focus them or define them as a short-term timeline, these will continue to be part of Nanaimo's long-term planning where they could be advanced as part of long-term initiatives. And the smaller scale improvements like curb letdowns or little sidewalk changes can always be considered through ongoing operational initiatives. So in the middle, we have the priority ideas that we believe are going to be achievable in the next five years and demonstrate good steps that support Nanaimo's vision for transportation in the downtown. So these ones are the focus of the Downtown Mobility Hub project. So looking forward to our next round of engagement, um, really the purpose is twofold here. We want to report back to the public on what we heard 
and we also want to present initial concepts for review and discussion. So this will be the first time that a lot of these concepts are coming forward. And so that means it's important for us to help people understand their concepts. Uh, this means that they're going to be updated and revised and changed as they go forward. And we want to hear public feedback as part of that discussion. So we understand where the issues um, and concerns that might be that require further investigation. Often, so one of our concerns always is when people see a design drawing, they think a decision is made. <laughs> so we really want to emphasize that that's not the case, that we want to emphasize this is our opportunity for collaborative review and we want to determine what works, what needs improvement, and what are the issues that need to be explored further in the next stages of design. And this feedback will be used to evaluate the options that are on the table. We're going to identify concerns and make sure those are thoroughly thought through as things progress. So our next um, second engagement is just getting underway, so we want to start raising awareness and make sure the community knows that there's opportunities to be involved. The main focus for feedback is a public workshop where people will be invited to see a presentation on the options and participate in discussions with the project team and other members of the community on the topics that are important to them. So we really want this to have be an opportunity for us to sit with people, share as much information as we can, and hear their thoughts. To supplement the workshop, we'll also be holding pop-ups in various locations around town and encouraging a broad response from throughout the community. We'll have an online feedback form that'll accompany the information so people can provide feedback that way. And at the end, we will prepare an engagement summary that documents the feedback received so that it may be used as input into the next steps, as well as information for future decision making. So we do anticipate that we are going to hear a range of voices as we go forward into this process. And our hope really is to have some thoughtful discussions with the community so concerns and suggestions, ultimately improvements to the concepts can be explored. Bernard, I'll pass it back to you to actually talk about the concepts. Thanks, John. So if we look at the big picture of what we're doing, you can see where the various cycling networks are, and we're going to talk in, in detail around each one of these now as we go forward. So the quick win opportunities, that came out as a, as a theme through the middle of the project. I believe it, it, some of it came out of this committee, in fact. So what were the quick, quick win opportunities? One was being the Victoria Wallace Albert. You could see in the public engagement, this was really rising to all the time, that the public were wanting to see something happen. <coughs> so what do we have there now? What's driving some of the concerns? The three-way stop control at a four-legged intersection, very unusual, confusing operation for users, um, inefficient safety concerns, challenging for pedestrians for sure. Future cycling infrastructure is going to be one day accommodated there as well. And as I said, identified as a high priority location by the community and then there might even be some land development opportunities around the site just given what the current conditions are there now. So in looking at that, we looked at all kinds of things and forgive me that says uh, refer reports attached, I see that didn't get it into, uh, that's not in your agenda package, but we did produce a um, memoranda for each of these uh, quick wins which talks a little bit more about the actual ideas that we thought about. But really what we've come down to is uh, in consultation with the Ministry of Transportation, they were saying that at the time of the three-way stop being implemented, they were concerned about queuing, traffic backups to the terminal intersection and such, and really shutting down the highway operation. I think you all know that the way the ministry is moving now, they've started up with their own active transportation uh, design guideline that they've put out, etc. So the, the emphasis around moving cars only is certainly starting to shift. So in the meetings we've had with the uh, Ministry of Transportation, they didn't express this as a concern. In fact, some of the comments they even made, well, we don't even mind if you close the road, for example. So we thought that was an interesting difference of opinion that seemed to have come uh, from previous folks um, you know, who, who were involved in commenting on how this intersection is going to be laid out. So the idea to install the temporary four-way stop control is really one of the quickest wind solutions that you could have because there's really only one leg that needs the stop control so it's some signage there is the opportunity to revise some of the geometry but the key thing is it allows you to then to also monitor what we can, what is happening there we can monitor the queuing we can monitor uh, uh, public feedback we can monitor safety around the intersection so that is really why it becomes such an easy um, quick win opportunity in that regard and i think it's portrayed as a hey we're going to try this let's see what happens the possibility, as I've, as, I, as I've made, I don't know if it's commented there, that there might, uh, the second point, that there maybe there's the odd community event that we could even close this road. 
and see how the public starts responding to those type of ideas. So really it allows you to the city to be as flexible as possible, gather public comment through that before we then look at far more uh, uh, formal um, changes there. The reason I say that is because it's, it's quite an unusual intersection, the geometry is very skew, it's, you know, with all the various approach angles, it's really difficult to function around that intersection. So we have looked at a concept design of that. Um, for it to work optimally, it would mean that we would land up having to restrict some of the largest vehicles, you know, the WB20 as we call them, you know, the, the semi-trailers, uh, would not be able to t make certain turn movements through that intersection just given its skew. So that's why I say it's to start with, to go in there, do a temporary, do all the monitoring, and then observe as to how best we might move forward with the permanent solution around that, and most importantly, get public response to that too. So that's where we're moving towards on that one. The other one was the Front Street Cycling Facilities, and as I mentioned earlier, I'm going to park all the cycling stuff until Richard comes up, so I'm going to just skip through those. Richard will obviously come back to these. The Bastion Commercial Intersection. So again, a lot of discussion around this. Signal, signal is at the end of its life cycle, and that's really what's driving a lot of the changes at this intersection. So it needs replacing and or some other measure. It does have high pedestrian traffic, but primarily in summer months. And they're very narrow sidewalks. I mean, there, there's an ex a picture of it right there. I think you all, all walked and experienced that. And then you get the sandwich boards out, and they just shut, shut it down even further. So a couple of the options that we looked at, one was to uh, make it a four-way stop. You know, you've got, uh, it's all stop controlled in, in, to some degree right now. So one could go out there, put four ways, uh, put, put stop signs up in all four approach legs, and that's pretty much all you, can, all you need to do from an infrastructure perspective, obviously turning the traffic signal. What we then did was a traffic analysis around that, and that's what we talked about the levels of service. And when we did that, that should be level of service, not level or service, apology for that. Um, in the morning, it was level of service A. In other words, there is no better level of service. The levels of service range from A to E. Um, D and E is where you start doing something. E is, e is really when you're starting to get to fail, fail conditions. So it's really around level of service D and often only E that cities start responding to make, to, to make and implement changes. So you can see we're, well, we're well, well far away from that threshold if we made it a four-way stop control. The other one was to put a two-way stop control on commercial street and allow that traffic to flow, um, the, the traffic rather on Bastion to flow through because of its connection to the bridge. And that also level of service in the morning was A, what was level of service A in the afternoon, level of service C. And then the last option we looked at was um, a pedestrian scramble. And there again, you can see very high levels of service. So this is what, for those of you who don't know what a scramble is, uh, it gives you one cycle where there's traffic movement in one direction, one cycle traffic movement in the other direction, and note there's no pedestrians in the cycle, in those two cycles. And then you have a third cycle where all the pedestrians move. So we looked at all of that. We did quite a, little, a lot of detailed analysis around that. We looked at some, some examples of where scrambles are most effective. And they are typically effective in a much bigger intersection environment where you've got multiple lanes coming in, you know, possibly two through lanes and a turn lane, big intersections. So people are really trying to maybe do a diagonal crossing, but they've got to cross all this way, and it's got a long signal time just because there's maybe four or five lanes they're trying to cross. Then they've got to wait and then cross all those other lanes. So it really is a long crossing for them. So that's where the scramble works really well, because then they can just do the diagonal, and everyone knows the turning movements um, all get taken care of. So traffic has its time, but then pedestrians know that they've got their time too, because when the scramble is on, you don't allow right turn on red at the same time. The one thing about the four-way stop control on commercial is that we do know it's a high pedestrian zone. We've seen that already. And if you, do not, if you don't stop uh, that one flow, of pedestri or one flow of traffic, we do feel it will, be, uh, it will be unsafe for pedestrians in that regard. And the other key thing about um, with signalization, being such a small intersection as it is, it's very easy for people to just dart across the road. So if you don't give them their formal time that they feel shows up at a reasonable time of, with waiting, that people won't be tempted to just run across the road when they see a gap. So that's why, again, we felt that the four-way stop control was, was the best solution, and that's where we've summarized it here. Prioritize pedestrian movements, reduces delay for all, for all modes at that intersection, um, minimizes delay in off-peak periods, 
key thing we often find with intersections is if they are signalized and there's really no traffic around, people are just stuck waiting, like why am I waiting here? That's when you find the, the adherence to the signal itself starts falling away as well. It's a quick low cost implementation, low maintenance from there onwards with the stop control. And then I've, I've mentioned the other discussion around the scramble. And again, key thing here, implement, monitor, see community feedback, evaluate, and then make decisions from there. Certainly part of the geometric improvements we would suggest, um, either temporarily or, or right now, you can see the curb bulges, reduce the, the crossing distance, and just really try and seek opportunities to widen some of those sidewalks, which certainly there are opportunities out there. So that was the, 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 the thinking with regards to best in commercial. Other priority, well, other intersections we looked at, which were not deemed the quick wins. The, the Wallace uh, Fraser Bastion, as you all know, there's the, this hasn't got a point on it, has it? Yes, I mean, we all know that there's this fifth leg here. So it makes it very awkward because pedestrians are crossing, then crossing, and there's, there's various signal times. Because of that layout, you have to have additional signal phases to accommodate that extra leg there. So from the community's perspective, it came out, I think, as your moderate priority. That the easiest way to address that was, would be to close that intersection, better improve the geometry around the intersection, but most importantly with that is A, we still need to take this to the emergency services to see how they would respond, you know, what are their concerns around that. You'd have to create the turnaround opportunity, which we've shown past, partially at the top of, on Fraser there, and then how does that affect the various land use operations that are in that, in that what will now be a cul-de-sac. Clearly we're going to retain all the pedestrian access and all of that through that area. But there's no doubt once you start putting future cycling facilities through here as well, that fifth leg really does become problematic for the safe operations for all modes in that area. And as I say, having walked there a couple of times myself, it's quite a long delay as you try and cross that leg as a pedestrian because it's not one crossing. You cross and then you wait and then you cross again. So if we look at our hierarchy, it really does suggest that uh, the best option would be to close it, but we do need to, as I say, have further consultation with emergency services and, uh, and address the turnaround issues and such. Other intersection, front and church, I think we all know um, for historical purposes, we've shown you at the top there as to how this all came about. Uh, you know, it was a big roundabout in the day. And uh, so we know we've got that big open space there with that very free flow um, right turn. So clearly the idea here would be to close that and uh, expand Dallas, Dallas Square Park, improve the geometry, improve the public realm, make it far more pedestrian friendly. If you go and walk through there now, that uh, little slip lane doesn't even have pedestrian facilities marked out. It doesn't have curb letdowns. So it's a little bit ambiguous as a pedestrian if you think of somebody who's blind who happens to maybe walk through there. There really is no direct indication as to what they're crossing because there's no curb letdowns and things like that. So there's no doubt that, that giving the pedestrian back that space and giving the public back that public realm, expanding the park area, is one of the, one of the better solutions as well and, and really helps traffic stop where it needs to stop, give pedestrians their time, give cyclists their time, and so and, and move on. So what I'll do now, I'll hand back to Richard, and Richard will run through all the various cycling facilities as well as the front street, so let me move back to that. So Richard, I'll hand over to you. Well, we have proceed any further, Councilor Bonner, did you have a question? No, I have a question. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Just so you know, there is a cycling facility there. Thank you. 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 I will now talk about the cycling facilities that are uh, part of what we call the short-term network. And as mentioned before, the idea is these are priorities for implementation within the next five years. So this is a map of the short-term bicycle network within the next five years downtown. We can see Front Street is the quick win on this map I'll just show here, extending from basically the transit exchange, eventually all the way around to Mafia Sutton Park and the Pearson Bridge. So what we're suggesting at a conceptual level is that the optimum facility for cyclists on Front Street would be a two-way cycle track. So as shown here, on the east side of the road, the water side of the road, again extending from uh, Mafio Sutton Park down all the way to Port Place, 
uh, and to the transit exchange. Be separated from traffic with some sort of barrier, as shown here, be concrete, could be wider in some spots and, and incorporate some landscaping or planters. The key reason that that is on the east side of the road is there are very few driveways and intersections on that side of the road. There's only a total of five, so a lot less turning vehicles conflicting with a cyclist and therefore a safer situation than if it were on the other side of the road or if we had bike lanes on each side of the road. So fewer conflicts with vehicles. It also provides direct connections into the park to the waterfront walkway and some of the other amenities on the water side. So as opposed to having people cross over. I'll show you in a moment when we get to a diagram of Front Street itself, there's uh, one spot where we have to take away some parking here on the east side of the road just north of Church. There's 12 parking spaces there that would be removed. They would be replaced with some more parking on the west side of the road. So we'd actually get a net increase of about 13 parking stalls. We're also looking at the opportunity to create some loading bays on the west side of the road. There are no currently loading bays, for example, in that area north of Church. So we're looking at the opportunity of creating some loading in there as well. It's relatively straightforward to implement this. It just requires, as noted here, some paint, some barriers, maybe some planters, a couple of signal heads just for cyclists going in the opposite direction. Total cost is in the range of about $400,000. And it is consistent with the long-term network plan, so that is money that would not be wasted. It's a money that it's money that's basically part of your long-term uh, implementation as well. Now, one of the key features of that of that concept is that the number of traffic lanes on Front Street would be reduced from four lanes to two lanes. So we looked at what that would mean in terms of traffic operations. There's basically, in a nutshell, there's not four lanes worth of traffic on Front Street right now. So we looked at how it would operate with two lanes. This is a chart here with a bunch of numbers, um, but basically, as Bernard was saying earlier, we measure what's called level of service. We measure it from A all the way through F, and just like in school, F is failing, A is the best, and we are dealing with basically A, B, and in some cases, C. So all very good levels of service, even with the reduction in traffic lanes. Again, basically because there really isn't enough traffic to justify four lanes as it is today, so reducing to two lanes does not make a significant difference. So this is an illustration conceptually again of what that cycle track would look like. Eventually extend down to the transit exchange. We stopped at this point at the ferry terminal at Mafio Sutton Park at the other end, eventually extending to the Pearson Bridge. Intersections and driveways are indicated with green. And these are a couple of cross sections that just show conceptually what would be on the street. Front Street isn't a constant width, the width varies throughout, so where we have the width, we would have the two-way cycle track, four meters wide, two lanes of traffic, parking on the west side, and all through here, so the bastion, we're able to actually add parking on the west side of the road. Where the, where the barrier, where the width allows, the barrier would be wider, we could incorporate planters or landscaping in that barrier to enhance the environment downtown. Where, where it's narrower, and this is generally in the section north of church, between church and chapel, we wouldn't have the opportunity for landscaping. The cycle track would be a little narrower, and we would just have a narrow physical barrier between the cycle track and the traffic lane. Now, Bernard talked about this, but there are some other cycling projects I wanted to talk about. So this, again, is a map of the entire downtown uh, showing the short-term network. So I talked about Front Street. The other one is something on, Pearson, on the Pearson Bridge. There'll be, uh, we're also showing protected bicycle lanes on Wallace and on Albert Street. I'll talk about those in a moment. Actually, first I'll talk about Albert Street. So this is basically the section from Victoria and Wallace all the way up to the top of the hill. So, and then continuing over the hill into what we call the S-curve down to uh, 4th Street, eventually leading to VIU. So the first section, we would take Albert Street, this section here, we would remove parking from the south side of the road, the downhill side of the road. We would retain parking on the other side of the road, the uphill side. We would put in protected bicycle lanes. So again, that's a bicycle lane that is protected from traffic by either a physical barrier, as in this, uh, in the downhill direction here, or in behind the parked cars and protected from traffic by the parked cars, as you can see in the uphill direction. This other illustration just shows that one of the typical treatments we would do at a bus stop, the bus stop, the bus is stopped in the, in the traffic lane at a, a large island, 
which is separated from the sidewalk, and the bicycle track is actually uh, the cycle track is actually raised through that section. The cyclists ramp up, pedestrians and people who are with disabilities can cross at level to and from the, the uh, bus stop island. When we get to the top of the hill, and we go over the hill into what we call the S curve. Basically, we have the protected bicycle lanes there, down the S curve, and then into eventually protected bicycle lanes on 4th Street. But those aren't in our short term five year plan. That's sort of the next step beyond that. We have protected bicycle lanes in the S curve. That would require widening, where the, the road isn't wide enough now to fit them into the existing roadway as we can further down on Albert Street. This is the long term ultimate cross section. It involves a retaining wall through here on the north side of the road and on the south side of the road where it slows down, we would have to widen, we'd actually have to extend the culvert there over a cat stream. So there would be some considerable expense in widening there. So what we've done is we've identified an interim option, a something less that the city could pursue in the shorter term in order to get the facilities in. Doesn't involve the widening downhill doesn't involve extending the culvert. What it does is it continues that protective bike lane all the way down to the bottom of the hill at Pine, but going the other way, because we wouldn't have the protected bike lane yet on fourth, the protected bike lane doesn't begin till past the culvert to avoid the need to widen the culvert, extend the culvert, and to avoid the need for widening in this, in this spot where it's uh, the, the tightest cross section that we have. So we'd be able to con continue the protected bike lanes almost to Pine Street in the interim condition. Now, one of the other uh, routes I talked about is Wallace Street, also looking at protected bicycle lanes on Wallace as well, so that would continue from Albert, so the Albert Street bike lanes come down. You'd be able to also travel along Wallace all the way over to Comox. Again, as on Albert, on one side of the road, there'd be cyclists would be protected from in behind parked vehicles. On the other side of the road, they'd be protected behind a barrier. In the section between Franklin with Fitzwilliam, the road is narrower, so to fit it into the existing roadway, we would actually have to prohibit parking on both sides of the road. Currently, you can only park on one side because it's too narrow, there's, there's not parking on both sides of the road. We would lose a few parking spots, about a half a dozen parking spots on that side of the road through that one section of uh, Wallace Street. In total, we'd lose uh, capacity for about 40 vehicles on, uh, 45 vehicles on Wallace from Albert all the way to Comox. And on Albert Street, we'd lose capacity for about 40 vehicles. Again, that's with parking being removed from one side of the road. Lastly, we looked at the Pearson Bridge in order to uh, improve the facility for pedestrians and cyclists, but particularly cyclists. Right now, there's just a couple of narrow sidewalks on the bridge. So this is a cross section showing the bridge as it exists today, six lanes of traffic with just some uh, narrow sidewalks on either side of the bridge. We've identified two options. Uh, the first option, we basically take away the one northbound lane of traffic and uh, extend the sidewalk out into the roadway so it becomes a wide shared pathway. The second option, we would put protected bicycle lanes on the road. We do also lose the northbound lane of traffic and we would have the bicycle lanes on the road at road level, but protected behind barriers. So either way, we either have this pathway down one side of the bridge, or we have the protected bike lanes. We've shown how they would connect in with the front, the cycle track on Front Street, especially with the pathway, that's a direct connection, as well as with the protected bike lanes on Wallace. There's also eventually the opportunity or the plans to put something in on Stewart, so we would connect in at the north end as well. So that's basically everything that is in the short-term cycling network plan for the next five years. So Front Street, Pearson Bridge, Wallace, and Albert. I'll pass it back to Bernard. I think we have a couple of questions. Yeah. Don't bring them now or later. We'll go ahead, Tom. I have a, a, a couple of questions. Sure. So, but, um, my big concern is the Front Street bikeway, and I'm on record as totally opposed to it, especially because of the Service Canada building. So what we're asking is we're asking the people to park on the other street, especially those with accessibility issues that are at that building a lot, having to wheel down the street, then wheel back up a big hill. We also have major concerns being raised from over 100 and some residents at the Pacifica, losing their parking and all that. So those are my big concerns. It's like, you know, if we're putting pedestrians first, we're certainly not doing that with that plan because we're making it harder for them to access, especially those with mobility issues, to access um, Service Canada, Fisheries, all those buildings. So there's, I, I personally, 
quite concerned about that because of, of the access issue, because Service Canada is a main building for a lot of those individuals. So that's one of the concerns I have. And then going to, and also the, the third one on that is that that's a main uh, road for police, fire, and ambulance, right? That's a main uh, route. That's also a main route in, in the sake of, um, what do you call it, emergency issues, right? Like, so that's, that's designated a primary route. So how would that impact? And I know I've spoken to uh, Mr. Rose about that to ensure that when we talk, we don't just talk to fire, and we talk to police and fire because that is a, a main road. And the same thing with the four-way on uh, Bastion Street. That, that's when I would really like to have the input because it's already hard enough for them to make the turn and if you're gonna narrow it, and that's a main road and the, and the fire trucks are down here at least, at least two, three times a day. So I really think we have, we need to talk to the emergency service personnel about that because they are the only, those are the only two roads in to the city and now you're congesting them even more and there's no way to get around if you put in those plans like you can now. So those are my big concerns on those two. Thank you. Councilor Hammonds. Thank you. Um, just a question about the Pearson Bridge here. Do you have cyclists coming um, south from Terminal onto Pearson Bridge? And the reason I ask that is your second diagram has has two green, um, what I imagine are cycle tracks, but that section of Terminal, no one rides. It's no, I know. And so in this option, the option that has the bike lanes on either side of the bridge, it's more about bringing cyclists down oh, the sewer to cross the intersection and then connecting it in. Now, if you're riding on Terminal, were one of those few cyclists that dares to do that, you'd be able to ride onto that um, protected bike lane as well. Okay, but the connection is to Stewart. Yes, that's and so that's why this one here shows me as well as uh, the connection up to Stewart, but on the east side of the bridge. Um, so before Council Brown, I have uh, two concerns. Um, number one, with regard to Front Street, um, I, I'm having trouble getting around through my head why it would be more important to have it on the east side as opposed to the west side if the destinations for most of the cyclists are for businesses and offices in the downtown area. It means they are going to be on the east side of Front Street and then have to cross over to get into the downtown. So in my mind, west, the west side makes a lot more sense. But, um, and then the other, the other thing, uh, maybe I misunderstood you, but Pearson Bridge, my understanding, is part of the uh, Trans-Canada Highway. And so is there any, there's no option for taking, I thought I heard you say taking a lane out of the bridge. Mm -hmm. Is that possible in a highway? Sure. It's, 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 okay, physic it's physically uh, possible, and I'll answer the Pearson Bridge question uh, first of all. It's physically possible that right-hand lane going northbound, as you know, is basically an exit to Stewart. The amount of traffic using the northbound lanes can be accommodated in two lanes, and they would still have the exit to Stewart. So that lane can basically be removed with, with minimal impact to traffic on the bridge uh, in terms of how it operates because of the way the intersections are at either end. With Front Street, we did look at basically three options. We have a cycle track on the east side, as we've shown. We looked at what it would mean to put it on the west side, and we also looked at what it would mean to split it with lanes. Either way, in all those options, we're down to two lanes in each direction. In all of those options, we're, we're having to remove parking somewhere. So we'd be taking parking off either that side of the road or this side of the road. This option is the best option for cyclists in terms of connections to and from the route. You know, at the various intersections, including things like the Pearson Bridge and the, and the park uh, at the north end and coming in from the waterfront walkway and down at the bottom end with the transit exchange. Uh, it, there are crossings at key locations that cyclists can make use of as well as pedestrians. One of the other things I didn't mention, I kind of glossed over it, is we're reducing the width of the road for pedestrians. So every, every one of the three or four pedestrian crossings the pedestrian crossing distance is less, so it's safer now for pedestrians where we're able to put in curb extensions that help them with that. We also looked at putting bike lanes in. That actually gets really tight. So it, it's the, in some spots, the road is almost too narrow for the bike lanes. So basically, we were left with a choice of on the east side or the west side. In terms of access, the, the east side works as well for connections to the bike routes, but it's far better for turning vehicles because there's far fewer turning vehicles making the turns in and out of these driveways on this side of the road as there are making the turns to and from the intersections on the west side of the road. So picking it for that reason, the east side of the road is overall a safer environment for pedestrians, and, uh, for cyclists. Thank you, Councilor Brown. Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, I write that section of turn. Wow. Yeah. Uh, no, of um, the one question I did have, and you may have not 
have all this information. I'm not sure um, what staff might be able to answer the question is, there's some potential upgrades to the, it's called the terminal trench next year, um, or in the coming years. And I'm just wondering, in terms of that downtown cycle track, um, the intersection of Colmox and the highway there is, Council Hammond has brought before, it's quite brutal for cyclists. Is there potential opportunity to make that crossing work better? I don't know the details of the upgrade. We have identified in the longer term plan that upgrades at that intersection would be, there would be upgrades to accommodate cyclists crossing over. So if you're coming from Wallace or down Comox and you want to access the other side of the road, whether those would be incorporated in the terminal trench project, I couldn't answer that. But we certainly have identified improvements that can be made at that intersection. We also terminate where, where it terminates now is because we recognize that intersection is so challenging. It's got a slip lane that's a hot slip lane and our people don't really, they just use it as a free flow lane because they know they're going to another turn lane beyond that. But that's a conversation with the ministry. So we've started some conversations with the ministry. They were certainly not opposed to losing that, that one lane as we're showing. Uh, but the details and logistics of getting the intersection upgraded given the hydro poles that are there, all the utilities that are there, the signals that are there, that's a much more costly exercise. So that's why we felt if we could stop it at the entrance to the park there, it does at least, it doesn't lead a cyclist to a dead end. They've actually gone somewhere to, to easily and comfortably go into the park and possibly use that pedestrian bridge that's in the park right now. So it doesn't just leave them hanging at the end of the day, but certainly that intersection is in that conversation. Yeah, sorry, I'm not, so, not so much thinking about that, that the north Okay. Sorry, so through the chair, so um, through this conversation, we're talking about ways to go around that intersection or to go out to Stewart, but I think what you're driving at is actually crossing. Completing the cycle. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So we are still looking at, all, at many of the things that came out of the, the terminal nickel study. There's a lot of things that we need to look at. One of the, uh, the uh, crossings at Wentworth, there's a few other things that are still to come out of this, but as you guys have identified, that is an incredibly complex intersection to get people through uh, and linking it in with Wallace is something that we're trying to, to hash out but it's it's not a <coughs> conversation so thank you anything for the council grounds oh that's great thank you councilor Armstrong and then councilor Martin um, thanks um, the other thing I was thinking about too go back to the front street the hotel is going in there so how is the hotel how are they going to have their own loading zone and put the bike lane there can you just so where's the yeah to <laughs> <laughs> the chair. So um, we've heard from the, uh, the residents of 38 front. I've actually gone uh, to a meeting with them the first week of December. And so with respect to the hotel, we're also going to have to have a conversation with that when the development yeah. comes in. So this is, this is concept level. We need to drill down to the details. These are not things that other communities haven't had to face and haven't had, haven't overcome. So, you know, we just need to get into it and get down to the brass tacks with these businesses and these residents and, and find out where we can um, manage all of their, all of the needs. Well, so. Councillor Turley, I totally support it on the west side. We want to support it on the east. That's that's a given. Um, my second point is fourth and out, great one. I think that's a really good concept. I think that's one that would really work, and I don't think you'll have any objections from anybody. And then going to the Comox one, if you really want to help try and solve that, don't have the left turn lane on Wallace, put it up one more, make no left turn lanes and you'll deal with half the issue. Because um, when I was policing, one of the biggest issues is people come around the corner, they stop right there because they want to go over to the left turn lane, right? So if you change that left turn lane, don't have Wallace your left turn lane, go back, take it up to Purdue, that would eliminate a lot of that blockage stuff. And then people would come around, but you would you would eliminate a lot of the people trying to go across. I remember we used to get tickets out there all the time because we're supposed to go into the first lane, not <coughs> to go into the left lane. Just just a thought. <coughs> I mean, people will be choked because you you know they might have to turn around and come back down to Wallace, but you would solve a lot of the Comox issue because most of the issue is the people trying to get over to turn left. Thank you. Thank right. you for all your work too, by the way. Thank you. Um, I think some of my thoughts were actually addressed, but my, my main concern is, of course, the east side with the um, front street, um, not only the hotel, but the residents of the building and the moving in and out. And I guess there must be some, perhaps, other solution to... We need to, to meet with them. And like I said, I've got that lined up for the first week of December, and so we'll be meeting with the uh, president and the property management team, and we're going to work through what 
their needs are and how we can manage it. And so and, and we'll uh, probably use that as uh, a bit of a template for the, the hotel. But I mean, I, you know, if you run cycle tracks in other communities, you'll see similar situations and it, it, there are solutions. There are solutions. I'm pretty confident we're going to be able to work our way through this. I'll leave it in your great hands. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. If I may, I was going to wait till later, but I'll, I'll jump in now. Uh, first of all, I'm I'm really appreciating this presentation, uh, and it's it's a, it's a pleasure to hear a knowledgeable and articulate uh, people, uh, plural, uh, so standing hard. in front of us. And we're not, that we're, that we're not used to that because we get it all the time. <laughs> Seriously, I am enjoying this, and I appreciate the expertise that, uh, that you're uh, obviously displaying with the subject matter. Uh, my first question, and I'm, I, I'll ask it to you, sir, but it might uh, be deflected to staff. I took the opportunity, not having much to do on the weekend, to reread our transportation master plan, which a lot of effort and time went into uh, before it came out in 2014. Many of our staff uh, were not here at that time or were here and have moved on. So I would just like assurance that things that we're talking about as we move forward are referencing this. You did, you did briefly make reference to it. I, I, I was really, having not looked at it for a while, quite impressed with what's in this document. And I found very little that I disagreed with, which will surprise some of my fellow councillors. So I'm hoping that we are using this as a guide. Yes. Thank you. Uh, that said, uh, I'd like to play devil's advocate on a couple of points. Um, you referenced Front Street and the fact that uh, vehicle traffic didn't justify three or four lanes. So do we have cycling traffic that justifies two lanes? You probably, well, you don't have it today. No, for sure, no. because nobody wants to ride. I, I, I didn't know the answer. To that. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, it's really a case of providing the facility. There is, to some degree, as as the experience in other communities has shown, a case of build it and they will come. But the key thing, and that we've emphasized in in our uh, technical memo on this, is that you want to make sure your bicycle network connects to things. So the front street cycle track connects to things at either end. And when we add the other routes in, they connect to it, and people can not only get downtown, but get around the downtown. And that's when you will see people start to use it. And I would expect that at that time, you will have two lanes worth of bicycle traffic to justify that cycle track. Mm, all right. Good. Thank you. Uh, my second question is, and I recognize that we're talking about a cycle track. I understand that. But at the same time, the top priority in this document was pedestrians. And I would be more comfortable if I heard more reference to pedestrian safety, uh, not just about cycling. So I know they tie together, they must do. So when we're talking about a cycle track and improving things for cyclists, I would like to also hear about how we're making changes to improve things for pedestrian accessibility and mobility. That's, a, that's, I guess, not a question, it's just a comment. Sure, well, the one comment we would make is that in general, slide which is the engagement, we have a, we have a menu in there of, of what the community was suggesting for quick wins pedestrian improvements, and I believe, Jamie, you might want to talk to that, that the city might have a whole initiative to look at those, but certainly it's not ignored. It, it, there's a whole, there's a lot. I see them going to, together. Yeah, absolutely. And, and even within the, within this project, we've made sure that there are, you know, appropriate uh, pedestrian facilities right the way through even this project. So, absolutely. Good. Thank you very much. That's it for questions for now. We'll no, don't. Go. Oh, <laughs> for water. How could I forget? We we'll just wait for everyone else. Right? Uh, just a couple of quick questions. Um, I, I really appreciate the report. Um, I, I understand the logic of having uh, the bike track on the east side. It makes perfect sense. I uh, appreciate that. Um, when you were looking at the traffic on the road, um, did you ever, um, one of your slides shows uh, a number of um, traffic, that one. Yes. Did you ever uh, look at the Gabriel traffic only being allowed to turn left so that it gets out to, through, um, uh, out to Esplanade, out to, um, 
terminal um, and not having it go on Front Street at all. I think, and just correct me if I'm wrong, but we've assumed the same, whatever's permitted today, we assume that that continued. So we didn't incorporate that into the results. Yeah. If I, sorry, if I can add as well, you'll notice that's a 2041 horizon here. So this is taking current traffic operations, I think we can a full-time count, and project them all the way through to 2041. And those are the volumes that you're seeing there now. So really, you can see how, you know, in terms of even future growth, the numbers just aren't there on On your um, slide where you have all the, I think, blue or purple lines for the white line, the one on the bottom. All of them, yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure. No, yeah, we were just there. Oh, oh, hang on a sec, there's another one. Here's all of them, yeah. Um, you have a, a line of color along the waterfront walkway yeah. where we don't have bikes presently. Uh, it's actually dashed, but you, it's hard to see. Yeah. So dash means it's, dash means it's a pedestrian facility. You can walk your bicycle, uh, but it's not a bicycle facility. I see. Okay. Thanks. Uh, yeah, those are two questions. Yeah, okay. Any more? No. Nope. Carry on. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Put your hands up. Not much more to go, folks. Uh, only got two more slides to run through the transit exchange. So again, in your in your pack, you will see the the full memo around the transit exchange. So there's been a lot of previous work done, uh, looking at different options. We've really dived into several several reports, and through all the various options of of we put a whole lot of criteria together as to what we thought might be the best. And you can see by the uh, by the traffic signals at the bottom there. Um, primarily looking at the Cliff Street, then looking at at the one sort of ter uh, on terminal itself, uh, which, by the way, the ministry wasn't overly pleased about, and uh, and then of course on Front Street as well. So, you know, the recommendation came through for Front Street. Community expressed their support for that at the engagement. It was a very specific question we actually asked of the community: Do they support that location? Uh, I mentioned earlier that we've got the benefit now of using that as a temporary location and we're getting very good real feedback from, from, uh, from the folks using the service as to how that actually is working, is it working for them. You don't often have that, that uh, prior insight from a community perspective as to how something might work. So that was a good advantage. Uh, certainly some safety cer um, um, concerns have been raised about that area. We have, though, produced a design brief around that. We've done site visits. We've, we, you know, obviously talked to RDN extensively on this. And uh, through that design brief, we wanted to capture all the different thoughts and ideas that came from the community, came from RDN, came from users, to make sure that when this does get advanced to the next stage, all of those things get accommodated. Safety, amenities, toilets, lighting, trees, all that type of stuff is captured in that design brief. And the only other piece was the parking strategy. So um, as Jana said, uh, when we presented this to the community, we did all our surveys. We've looked at supply, we've looked at demand, we've looked at occupancy. Um, we've, we've just finished a big turnover survey as well. The parking restrictions that are currently in place, we've looked at and we took the engagement feedback as well. And we really want to highlight the, uh, the findings if you look at this, at this chart here. Um, occupancy, you're sitting on a weekday, you know, roughly in the order of 50%, 55%, weekend 65%. And in terms of total space, you can also see the, the on-street occupancy, so that's off-street lots and, and on-street. So there was certainly overwhelming support at the open house that there was no, nobody challenged this, that, that these stats are, look, there's a lot of parking folks. We just don't really know how to get there. And, uh, you know, that you can drive into the downtown, you drive into Commercial Street, the, the, you're actually on top, almost on top of a parking lot, but you don't necessarily know how to get to it. Uh, you've got the, the other one just off Bastion as well. So better signage certainly came through strongly. Uh, one of the comments was that to possibly in terms of the strategy going forward is if you made parking free at night or towards the evening so that people would come downtown and, and not let it turn into a ghost town. Obviously, as you're getting redevelopment down there and residents are starting to live there, you'll get more and more people on the streets. But there was some, some discussion around that, some thoughts that uh, the community gave us on that. And uh, the other comment was 
that, look, if we want to discourage people from driving downtown to then enable all these other active mode facilities to be implemented, we should have a segmented pricing. So in other words, more expensive pricing in the downtown core, and then you segment it out and you get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. So people then feel that they don't have to park right outside the door um, on Commercial Street. Obviously, those um, tenants, the, the, the shop owners, felt that they needed that spot right outside their front door. But, you know, I think that uh, we certainly heard uh, both sides of, of, of that coin. So we're still busy working on the, on the strategy in that regard. We've just finished up the actual turnover survey itself, and uh, we're busy seeing what those percentages are, and we're busy wrapping that up. But really, this is what the general sentiment might be moving towards, is how do we make sure it's balanced for everyone? I think that's pretty much it. So I heard there was going to be questions on the uh, We have Councilor Armstrong, then Councilor Bonner. I have a couple questions on engagement. One probably will be for yourself, and the other probably for our staff. Um, I was out this weekend and I, I was talking to a lot of people about the mobility study. Now, none of them knew about it. They're all North End. So one of the questions they said is there, and they all have the, the city app, is there a way that um, you could notify them on the city app that here's a study to look at? That was a question that came up because they went looking for it, couldn't find it. They found it very confusing. And the other thing that I heard was, is it possible that you could set one up at Wood Grove and one up at uh, North Town Centre where there's a lot of population that don't go downtown for the reasons that were expressed here? Like, I hear all the time, I don't go downtown because of parking and safety. Those are the two big things I hear. So I was just wondering if you could comment. Oh, sorry. Uh, through the chair. So um, through both first and, and the previous round of engagement, the future one, we have to do quite a bit of social media. Uh, but I'm quite sure we could link into uh, some of the new technology we're, we're rolling out. Um, and with respect to the engagement at the North End, we are planning a pop-up at Woodgrove. Oh, uh, we hadn't uh, talked about one at uh, the Nile North, but it's always a possibility. So. Yeah, just because I, I do hear that from people, and, and a lot of those people have the disposable income too, right? So. And um, thank you, and, and thank you very much to all of you for the presentation. It was really interesting. I think I, I found the parking one very interesting. Uh, I didn't know those figures. Although, when I look at it, I, I remember that the last council was also the opinion there was plenty of parking available downtown uh, when they were talking about the event center. Um, so, in the event that we're <laughs> taking some of these parking out before these, um, for these uh, bike lanes, um, we're still going to have plenty of room, I'm guessing, for the news figures downtown for parking as it exists right now. Um, I also uh, hope that as we develop our strategy, um, making it more less convenient for cars to go downtown uh, would then up the people using other other forms of transportation down there. Uh, like I mean, I've been in London, right? And if you have a car, you can't get into the centre on odd days if you have an odd license. So. Uh, there, it's, it's just a question we have to increase our public transit and we have to increase the safety of our bike lanes and pedestrian crosswalks to get people to move around. So to, while we're talking parking, I can just quickly talk to you about that uh, on Front Street and where the parking would be replaced. It was interesting, so we looked at all the data around events <laughs> and we did an event survey two weeks ago. What does it find in the point? About two weeks ago, we did a web candidate um, survey for all the months for events that the events that are going on. What's interesting, you know, we know that there's a lot of conversation around this area here. You know, the hotel um, is full and then air parking is taken up by event, etc. So, what we notice here is that here we get 25 new parking spaces, which is very conveniently located close to where the event center is and where that concentration of parking actually might be versus where we might where we potentially losing the trial spaces which is further away. So that was almost a coincidental win if this goes if it does go ahead, you know, be off beyond the stage and which side it might land up on, that, that additional parking actually lands up close to where there seems to be high demand for the event. But there's no doubt that the wayfinding, getting people to know where parking is and obviously the eventually go to the electronic parking so people know exactly how many bays there are available to them, all those types of things. Hugely, hugely helps with people not just randomly driving around and then looking like they're occupying street space and, and ooh, look how busy the streets are. Meantime, maybe 10%, 20% of that traffic is just trying to find the next parking spot versus a sign. I know there's four parking spots there, so I'll head straight to the There's none of this 
for pedestrians, cyclists, and transits all in, in one sort of project for five-year horizon. Um, my one question is around transit, and I believe the transit future plan calls for an eight to ten sort of exchange, which I think would be compromised a little bit by the on-street design, and I'm just curious in terms of, um, I understand not wanting to eat up very much of one port drive in terms of land, um, uh, it's prime available land. Um, if there's any analysis there, when you lose the sort of left in, left out, right in, right out of an exchange, are we going to see inefficiencies, uh, or sorry, efficiencies not gained by that type of trend rock exchange design? Jay, do you want to take a comment? Uh, so just to go through the chair, I just wanted to sort of speak briefly to it. We haven't gone into the details of it yet, but the preliminary numbers we're looking at are more like 10 on-street phase maybe some more capacity depending on some shifting of things around. So um, the other thing is that, um, and actually the audience here to speak to it if uh, need be, but the shift away to, to, to the downtown has recouped a substantial amount of capacity. So two buses a year. Two uh, <laughs> exact numbers, but all it's a joke. Joke. <laughs> <laughs> So just to that end, I mean, this is, and for follow up, then, um, if you went with an on street approach, uh, would one roundabout that's been proposed or potentially two roundabouts? That I think the, at one point the downtown plan had a two roundabout type exchange, would that allow you to achieve the same uh, efficiencies in the future as they may be required? Introducing roundabouts does provide us with a lot more flexibility, and uh, it's something that we are doing right now. So, but we are just waiting to um, um, land on site before we uh, get too far into the details. Perfect. Well, thanks so much. Thanks, here. Councilor Bonner. Thank you. Um, I'm on the same track. Um, I use uh, the bus exchange quite a lot. I appreciate it being down there then on the um, but I, I'm not, and having done, I'm, I'm assuming these things are coming in the future. It is hard to get back and forth across the street, and cars are coming down there way too fast. So uh, a lot of the people I'm talking to down there are complaining about those two issues. Yep. Councilor Armstrong. Um, two questions. One thing, and, and, and I do have a bike, but I don't ride the roads for just the reason because I don't have the experience to do it. But. The parking for the bike, like the parking for bicycles, where would you put them? Because like, if you are coming down and you do want to shop, you want to secure it someplace safe, not the trees, because the trees are all getting damaged. So is there a plan to put them in certain key locations, number one? Through the chair, yeah. So uh, that sort of gets into the conversation about um, uh, the public realm. So we want to be able to give people these energy mm -hmm. facilities so that they don't have yes. angst about bringing a bike down and it becoming damaged or damaging yeah. something or else. Yeah. And the second point, too, goes to the back to the transit location exchange. We did get a letter from one of the accessible groups that they don't like that exchange down there. Uh, it came in from, I can't remember which group it was, because um, they don't feel safe, I think was one of the big issues. And, and I'm assuming a lot of that stuff will be looked after. I think it was design style, because I was here the first time when it was down there. It was a great spot. And, and we do hear from a lot of people that they do think it's safer down there. So I was actually kind of surprised to see that. But. Just so you're aware, there was a letter came in from one of the accessibility groups of concerns about that. Councilor Thor. Thank you, Chair. Through you, uh, I'd like to go back to parking, and I just need to make a comment, and, and perhaps this is anecdotal, but I, I personally feel I'm getting really mixed messages on uh, downtown parking. Um, and even in, even in this report on page 16, it says most participants uh, surveyed felt there's sufficient downtown parking. And then on the very next page, there is a map with no less than 15 spots indicated. Uh, Selby lot often full, hard to find spaces in Old City Quarter, hard to find parking in Wallace, Stonesmere lot often full, hard to find parking in Marshall, and so on and so on and so on. Uh, my personal experience is certainly at peak times when the Port Theatre is being used or there's an event like the Economic Summit, 
uh, that we had recently, uh, good luck finding a parking spot in the uh, the downtown parkades. And maybe that doesn't happen too often, but it does happen. And with at least one more hotel coming on stream right downtown, and more residences downtown, I just can plus uh, in also in your in the transportation master plan, as I recall, it indicates the projection of 25% more vehicle traffic between now and 2041. Uh, there's a reality is that as much as we might want people to get out of their cars, there are going to be more cars downtown. And they're going to need a place to park uh, reasonably close to where they want to go. Maffeo Sutton Park is a real concern to me when we have big events there. And for many people with mobility issues, there is nowhere close that they can park, or there's very, very few spaces available. So I'm just, I'm just commenting that as yep. my personal perspective, uh, it's a concern for me. There was certainly discussion at the open house as well, and ideas given that to have shuttles where you actually tell mm -hmm. people where to park, and then provide an easy shuttle for them, or whatever sorts it might be, um, so that people are not feeling they've got to come to the downtown, to the event, they can maybe park just slightly further away, and there'll be some form of shuttle service provided. So those ideas were discussed by the community at the open houses around particular events. Yeah. And that's certainly one good possible Absolutely. solution. Yes. Yep. Uh, yeah, through the chair. So I think that it's really important to, to sort of um, be clear, this is a management strategy. So we're, we're trying to balance off all the needs and, and special events and, and things like that. Like uh, it was actually the day before, um, we did the turnover study in the parkades. Um, uh, the bylaw division called me and said, well, we've got a perfect storm. Everything's full. Every, every venue's booked up. I think the only place that didn't have an event going on was the Bay of And so, um, you know, that's actually a really good thing because it just shows that everybody wants to be downtown. So it means that everything else that we've done has been successful. So now we just need to find a way to manage this demand. And so whether it's a traffic control plan for events or whether it's a parking management strategy that has some shuttle service, you know, these are things that we can work through, but it is kind of a good indicator. So I agree. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Thorpe, I don't see any further questions. Hearing none, I'd just like to thank the staff and the committee for all their excellent work and continued work. I believe there's another session signed up to attend, so uh, thank you very much, and we look forward to another report. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Tuesday. Well, Mr. Sheriff, Mr. Chair, just, just to, uh, to remind you that we have a recommendation in front of Council to, um, to approve and finalize the location uh, of the Front Street Transit. Oh, right. So okay. this, is, this has been uh, the subject of many discussions, but it is uh, something we'd like to see move forward. So if uh, the committee could consider that, we'd greatly appreciate it. And of course, we're here to answer further questions on a specific matter. Somebody'd like to move. Councillor Brown, second. Councillor Bonner. Discussion. Seeing none. Uh, okay. I just um, follow up on Councillor Brown's uh, comment about um, the capacity of that the on street downtown uh, option for the transit exchange. Um, I just want to make sure that we're not uh, hemming ourselves in 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 the ability of, of that location if we go with the on-street option and not um, potentially having some expansion into the, the property. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I can't speak unequivocally, but we're going through the details of that to make sure that we don't uh, end ourselves in or, or uh, restrict ourselves in the future. Great. So we end, we're working with the RDN to make sure that they've got, basically we like, work with their needs uh, Thank you, and um, through you, I guess, probably over there is, um, I know this is probably going to take a while to do all the design up and everything, because we're talking around about and everything else. Um, is there any way to tweak the area a bit, just to make it feel a bit more safe, more lighting, um, better better uh, managed crosswalks, uh, just in the in interim? Uh, yeah, we can definitely explore some options. Um, I, I'm thinking off the top of my head what, are the, what options are out there. Yeah, I'm not asking right there. now, right? But uh, it, it just would make things a little bit easier now. Any further questions? All in favor? Opposed? Carried.
My apologies, sir. Oh, that's okay. Okay, next on the agenda is um, agenda planning. Mr. Chair, um, so on the very last page of your agenda has the Governance and Priorities Committee agenda planning sheet, and I just wanted to point out a couple of um, errors or changes, actually. They were right at one point, just not any longer. Um, so public safety is noted as, um, as December the 2nd, and it's actually going to be on November the 28th, and it's actually Mr. Rudolph and not um, Ms. Fry that is the staff member responsible for that one. So um, Jake, Mr. Rudolph is going to um, lead that session or lead that group through a public safety day on November the 28th, Governance and Priorities Committee. And as well, um, that's missing from here is possibly a, a December 2nd special meeting for fees and charges from Mr. Harding. And then we do have um, MIABC. Um, they will be coming in to speak with council on December the 9th for part of that day anyway. So I just wanted to give you those updates. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, through you to Ms. Curry. I'm uh, just wondering, um, we did pass a motion for ones related to art. Uh, yes. oh, so I do have an update on that as well. So that one we were, um, for the January 6th, the first meeting that is scheduled for the new year, um, because Mr. Harding is hoping that the new um, culture manager will be here by that time, and looking for some activities to provide you for that day. So uh, arts and culture is scheduled tentatively for the um, first meeting in January, the 6th, and then maybe Mr. Rudolph can tell you what else is planned for January near the end of the month. Okay. Mr. Chair, we tentatively scheduled the GPC at the end of January as your strategic plan review. Your annual check-in on that, as well as probably a date to try to map out the topics of priority for you to schedule in you know, several months in advance. So that would be a real, it's kind of a gut check and a reality check for you. Use that term once in a while, but really in terms of the strategic plan and projects and the alignment of our business plan and all that. So it's a good idea to have a strategic plan check-in once a year. And it's not expecting robust change, but possibly updates re-emphasis of some of the priorities of council after a year in place. So that's tentatively the 27th or 8th of January. That will be our next scheduled uh, GPZ that month. So just, of course, that's all subject to your blessing and agreement to do that at that time. It's, it's a proposal at this time. And we have a lineup of facilitators to help with that. Great. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Gazebeck and Councilor Harris. Thank you, Chair. Uh, through you, uh, w one discussion um, that uh, I would like to uh, telegraph of having a need for, and also um, I know we spoke briefly about including it into the session that we had on community engagement and communications, is that regarding uh, the neighborhood associations and, and, and having a look at sort of how um, we are interacting with them and how uh, we're providing support with them in the sense that having a bit more standardization of like, what is the city policy on um, when a neighborhood association becomes an association that we uh, interact with, how many members does it need, what sort of governance uh, uh, accountability is in the structure of the organization, and what type of support is supported to it. And I know that would take a uh, you know, a bit of resources to actually uh, implement something like that. But I think that it's a discussion that it would be worthwhile having, uh, especially uh, taking into account uh, coming up with the OCP refresh and potentially looking at an avenue that we might be able to leverage community engagement and uh, a little bit more proactively sometimes uh, through the neighborhood associations and have them, um, yeah, as allies and, and a resource. Thank you. Council Thank you, Chair. Um, fully support that idea. I think it's a really good one. Um, the Coastal Communities uh, Social Procurement Initiative uh, Scale Collaborative, which is managing that portfolio, is um, open and doing presentations in front of councils who have kind of bought into the strategy. Then we could um, we could invite them, and they could just give a presentation to council, or we can invite them to the GPC um, to kind of get some ideas going and kind of get our legs under us as far as that initiative goes. 
And I'm curious um, if the MIABC one on December 9th is not a full GPC, perhaps we can invite them on that day, because I don't think that will require a full GPC either. Thank you, Chair. Through you, uh, just to uh, uh, Councillor Hemmins. Um, so, would this be having the um, social procurement initiative representative come speak to our, our council? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so, Scale Collaborative is managing the Coastal Community Social Procurement Initiative, mm -hmm. and then municipalities are buying in. They're kind of like the oversight of our organization. So, yes, they would come. Yeah. And, and just a point of clarity, mm -hmm. do we, uh, to, 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 to get items uh, put onto the GPC agenda, for example, for the social procurement initiative, do we want to have a motion uh, to have that, you know, be, be added? Yes. Yes. Okay, thanks. So I, I, I move uh, for sure to have the um, social procurement initiative mm -hmm. come present to uh, a GPC at the next available <laughs> opportunity. It may not be that one. Discussion? I just double checking this because we just saw it this morning that we are actually counting the finance and audit next Wednesday with a procurement uh, discussion because our policy requires that we do it every three years. So this is part of that. So you'll have a precursor to that. In, Next week, with an introduction, so the whole policy is on the table. But there is a, there are some sections <laughs> on social procurement in there, but it would, it would be sort of a the submission could piggyback, I guess, on that process. So I'm just saying that because I knew I just seen that this morning. So uh, you'll be receiving an information report about the procurement uh, policy. It needs to be reviewed. But coming from Ms. Mercer next Wednesday, and then we'll be introduced to all of the procurement issues, and this is nested in that environment and a whole other set of things can be addressed more fully there. So. Thank you. Just in response to that, so um, Jane Rushton, who's the manager of procurement, um, we've met a couple of times and she had indicated that um, <clears throat> she would be looking to uh, bring in a consultant who is who specializes in social procurement to help develop that new procurement policy. So I think it's already seated within the conversation that's happening. So it would it would be so, a wonderful so, pairing. And this is actually coming to you next week for a preliminary. It's this is our policy. This is the process to move forward. So whether there's additional presentations later on, I guess could be in the context of that. It'll come next week as well. Any further discussion? Clear what the motion is. All in favor? Carry. You make your other one for the meeting associations. Mm -hmm. I'll let them move it. I was just going to remind them of this. Yeah, just that. Uh, thank you through, through you, Chair. Um, yeah, just regarding the discussion on the neighborhood association, I mean, it will be a, an iterative process, I, I imagine, but it would, would be possible, yeah, to assess the staff uh, to schedule a time to maybe review the, the current policy on neighborhood associations and, and have a discussion uh, regarding um, what are some possibilities in terms of providing more support or uh, standardizing sort of our, our, our procedures with, with them. So, 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 I don't is, is, there, is there any comments that staff would like to make on, on that before a motion is put on the floor about the I, I would like to suggest that maybe it's an opportunity if you're talking about that part of engagement that we have a re, bit of a refresh on our engagement kind of period and that that's part of it. We've got bang the table coming on and I'm not sure where we're at with some of the engagement, but it could be an opportunity to have a day more of a broader conversation as well as on the neighborhood associations. Don't want to dilute that particular I thought, but it's probably there's other things that we could also companion that with as well. Thank you. I, I think that's a wonderful idea. Going back to Councillor Armstrong's earlier point, um, the city has an app, and it's saved my butt a few times on a few things, and I think we could use it better for engagement. We could kind of throw it out of it. Thanks, Chair. I, I certainly support uh, Councillor Gesselbrock's idea. I think we need to have a discussion about our neighborhood associations and what, uh, how they're structured and, and uh, how consistently they're, 
they're operated and what we expect of them and what they might expect in return of us. I think it would be a very worthwhile discussion. So, uh, no, I think it's important because I know that some of them only have two people on them. Others have their own, like we have our own in our community, which hasn't been recognized, and they'd like to know the process of how to be recognized for like park work. So I think it's a really important discussion to have because I know there's they have a big, big impact, and sometimes two people have an impact that people don't even know that they have an association in there. Uh, so I'm moved that uh, we schedule a GPC. Uh, Topic of uh, public engagement, um, an update on on different emerging issues, uh, and a, a specialty focus on the neighborhood association. Second. Councilor Armstrong. Further discussion. Seeing none. All those in favor? Carried. Anything further? Hearing none. Motion to adjourn. Nope. Is there any comment? No. 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 Motion to adjourn. No, there's no questions on the sheet. I already checked. Second. Thank you. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. Sure. Um, I so this one goes to the Sure. You'll be there. Is that the seniors? Okay. Is that the seniors? The seniors.